So the six steps, which I won't belabor now, I will go through in detail, uh, go through a bunch of things at the end of the day, we really do want efficient programs. Um, but at this point, I'm going to go somewhere in the middle and, and first uh, figure out, okay, what, what, what are the theories we're talking about? Um, so we're gonna talk about theory graphs. Uh, so maybe you don't see, uh, quite comprehend this one. Uh, this one is actually meant for humans to organize a bunch of math theories um, and is dreadful uh, for using on a computer. So you know, it jumps around too much, but it's great. Uh, getting better magmas and sending groups and monoids and groups, which we're getting closer to the level of granularity that's interesting uh, to me um, that we kind of want to say, but we're still jumping levels too much. Uh, getting somewhat better you know, groupoid and cancel and dividable groupoid and quasi group groupoid is the only name for magma, depending on which, uh, where you're from. This is great because each arrow, in a sense, adds one idea at a time to the theories. And, and this uh, fits my way of seeing things much better. And at the level of theories, the theory graph that we're interested in is full of diamonds. And so uh, if you're a PL person who's done too much, oh, oh you hate diamonds. Uh, that's because you're trying to put diamonds in your implementations. If you put diamonds in your signatures, you're golden. It's all good. Uh, higher dimensional diamonds, uh, modal logics are full of them. Like it's great. They're so nicely structured. Uh, like, great. And these are theories in a different logic. And, and you know, once you get, again, uh, trivial logic up to S3, uh, this is a hypercube uh, with a few extra edges. It's like, oh, this is lovely. That means that really uh, for specifying all of this from an information theory point of view, there's much less that I have to say and the rest is a push out. Done, it's great. Let's get the algebra to work for me. So underneath a bunch of algebras, it's more algebra. And this is where I want to leverage that, uh, that structure. So that I as a human being uh, need to stay less and get everything. So let's take that theme of me as a human being uh, saying less. If we take monoids, writing down monoids as a theory might look like this in a language, right? We have our types, two operations, and three axioms. And if we want to write down commutative monoid, we repeat ourselves like crazy. And only one line has changed. And, and this is offensive. Like to me, like I hate repeating myself so much. And then you go and you look in libraries of almost any of your preferred uh, algebra system. And they have things like additive monoid. They, they already had a monoid and now they have a complete total copy of it just because they decided to use plus instead of times. And their system cannot handle reading. And even in programming languages, we find this like in Haskell, there's monoid and additive monoid because renaming is not an operation on uh, signatures, theories, type classes. I don't care what you call them. They're all the same thing. Uh, and then, of course, an added the commutative mono, I've repeated myself yet one more time. And this is. <clears throat> so, what you really want to do, because eventually, you know, the algebraic zoo of this is a tiny fraction of, of the things that you really want to say, like rings and fields and blah, 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 very quickly, it, it starts to look like this. Uh, if you're going to be repeating yourself that much, that's a lot of work. So you don't want to do that. So the obvious thing to notice is, and this has been noticed 30 years ago, 
there are languages that, that specification languages, not programming languages, that let you do the equivalent of this. And a commutative monoid is just a monoid extended by an axiom, and you're done. You've not repeated yourself anymore. And renaming is a first class operation where, where you can rename start to plus and e to zero, and, and renaming is, is a known operation in all sorts of places. So we'll come back to that. And, and then we know, yay, if we combine these two, it's some sort of push out. At least that's our instinct. We have a base theory of which we've done two different extensions. We just want to do that again. We kind of like to say that in one line. Now, can we create a language where instead of this being the operational semantics, which works by extension, can we have a proper denotation? Can, can this make sense other than just being symbol shuffle? So the obvious thing to do there would just be to say um, commutative monoid and then do the renaming again. Yes. You don't want to do that? Um, because you end up renaming over and over and over again, because you end up having a whole graph being a copy of another that's renamed. So you might want to do the rename on the graph, but um, the trick is um, you want to do the renaming as a primary operation because you want to be able to see two monoids inside of a ring. If you don't do it this way, you'll only see one of them. The other one will be something else. And you want there to be a theory morphism twice. From right. So I want you to find a, um, a ring by starting with monoid and using it twice yes. in some way. One three name. That yes. makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and that, in fact, is exactly what I was asking you about this, because doing this seems to make it hard to do that, right? Is this giving me uh, two copies of monoid, one with plus no, and one with this, star? This does not. So the way to get two copies is you need to uh, extend carrier to monoid with a rename twice. Yeah. Then it doesn't glue the two of them together. If I just drop over monoid and say over set, that would do that, right? Right, okay. yes. So you change the base of your push out. So you have to figure out what do you glue together and what do you not. So whatever comes after over is what gets identified between right. the two. That's that's the same like that's the important semantics of, of your push out of what do you do and, and, and what do you not. No, no, you draw it or something. Nah, I'll, I'll come back to it. So it seems crucial that you're remembering that the thing that you're building is a monarch. Yes, it's not but just as, as a, a renamed monarch. As a library builder, you need to know what you're doing. Uh, because you 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 need to start writing things like this, and, and I you know. Uh, say Mufang loops and, and shelves and right and racks and, and uh, uh, spindles and quandles are actually something that you find in, in, in Wikipedia and physics and all of that. And I put them up here uh, just because I knew that pretty much nobody knows about this, uh, but they are algebras that you really do want. Uh, but if you then go to the stuff that one does know, culminating in fields and, and domains and boolean rings and rings and dialogues. And, and this is stuff that appears in computer science much, much more, but it looks the same. And the trick is, yeah, you, 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 they're all one-liners, but they're very, very carefully designed one-liners. You make a small change and, and you get something quite different. So, uh, Clean the algebra, right? Yeah, it's different. Now, that's actually right. But it's clean algebra is just uh, a particular kind of semi ring, right? It's eigenpotent semi ring, and so up to renaming, it's like make it it's easy. But I also really don't want to have to use some of the other notation for writing the same thing. So we really do care what. Well, yeah, you, like you, you, you want uh, you want the redundancy just because um, 
something is already exists, uh, it might have all the wrong symbols. And so you, you want the other one too from a usability point of view. The usability is where renaming is extremely important. So but what gets represented under the hood is just the operations and the equations, right? So if I go okay. somewhere in two different ways, that's the whole thing. Yeah. Well, so uh, you're leaving a heck of a lot of stuff on the table if that's all you do, right? So if, if this is why I spoke about, oh, maybe we want denotational semantics for this to do more than just looking at the theories. If all we do is operational semantics and expand all that the theories, we've lost a whole bunch of stuff. And I, I, again, you want equivalence of models as well, but-, but uh, uh, Right, you want, you want, the reason that you wrote this down actually gives you more structure. Why do you leave that structure on the table? So now we want to see, okay, what can, can we actually do with that? Uh, hey, look at that. Uh, right now we have the theory that tells us that. Um, and, and I'm not gonna go through this in detail. What I mainly want to say is if you take a dependent type theory like parking lot type theory, the context uh, already with substitution uh, form a category. And the uh, actually the renamings are a particularly nice uh, subset of the morphisms that uh, induce some nice transformations. Uh, so with respect to renamings uh, and, and what are called extensions, uh, you can form all pullbacks. Now it turns out that the category of context is the opposite of the category of specifications. So in the category of specs, we do pushouts to glue things when we do co-limits. When we work in the category of context, we do pullbacks. Um, and, and basically, you know, I'm, I'm basically telling you there is a lot of theory and I, I'm not going to belabor it. And in particular, uh, these extensions over the category of context is a fibration, the codomain fibration. And so that lets us come back down to our pollinators and give them uh, not one, but three denotations. Uh, I'll leave one behind. One is what we've just seen. Uh, it's expanding theory. Uh, and uh, the R's are renamings and combined here has extra stuff in it. Do I add it in the next slide? No. Um, the problem occurs at the simplest possible level is to do uh, uh, some theory is just uh, X is a type and some other theory also says X is a type. And you combine uh, T and S over the empty theory. Uh, the semantics is clear. I have two types, neither of which makes sense to call X. You now have lost control of your names. You now need to tell me because these two are going to clash in the result. What are the names going to be? That's what these renames are. It only like you, you basically come back and control your names, even though in the semantics, all of the pullbacks exist, but the pullbacks exist uh, up to arbitrary renames. And, and that's usability nightmare. Okay, but this is also some kind of usability nightmare. I mean, you, you could say there's default how I know to that you, that you get, so you don't actually ever have to write. Yeah, but like it's because if, if you're going to call this a theory that the user is going to look at and, and it's going to have evil names, and then they're going to build on it and build on it and build on it, and each time there's system given renamings, all of a sudden your names are going to look like. X dollar one, dollar seventeen, dollar twenty three. I mean, oh, they're going to at least be a part of through the graph. Right. Them. And then the difficulty with those no. names that are 
uh, pass through the graph, leave a trace of how the library was built. And if somebody changes the library, how the library was built, those break. So, so there's there's issues. I mean, you want control. You really do. This allow you to rename any names, not just flash. This mandates you to rename. It, me, it, re, it mandate you to rename anything that clashes. But the syntax doesn't say that. Um, so uh, uh, in the syntax of combining over here, I snuck, snuck it in. You haven't said, sorry, where, where does it say they went from flash? Um, in the semantics, uh, not in the semantics. definition, so, it says they must not clash. And this so is the Build renaming into combine. Yes. And then have a side condition that says after the renaming, the names must not clash. That's right. Or you've already got renaming. So why not just say when you combine two things, the names must not clash? Can you use renaming if you need it to ensure that? Yeah. So absolutely both work 100%. And uh, we found. Mine has two fewer symbols than yours. Mine is better. You build. Uh, uh, a hierarchy with a thousand theories, and we'll compare and we'll see which one is better. <laughs> the right. So, uh, so, uh, so you seem to think there's a reason why doing it your way is better, which is fine. Right. Can you tell me what it is, please? Uh, yeah. So when I got to here, uh, I tried both ways, and uh, there were fewer lines of code and was more readable. Uh, Okay, so what you discovered in practice is that pretty much every time you need to rename, so if renaming is a separate construct, then it'll be slightly longer than if you have to rename and build it. Yeah. Okay. It, it, and it, it's 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 just that it's it's not deeper than that. Um, the 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 useful part is um, what we, you notice it um, if we instead of interpreting our combinators as denoting theories, but as denoting Theory morphisms. They have that semantics. And can I use delta here because doing backwards? So these really are display maps in the category of context, which are the nice ones that, that we want. Um, and so what this means, for example, is that um, commutative now truly is uh, an adjective uh, that you can apply to a theory graph uh, in, in just the right way on top of a, of a magma. Uh, and, and so we think of commutative that way already as something that you can apply as a transformation. And that's what this semantic says. Yes, that makes sense. So, so these meta variables, A1 and A2, because of this choice of syntax, they have to stay meta variables. You can't make them variables in your program because you need to know what are the names that appear in A1 and A2. Yeah, yeah, yes. So you actually stop yourself from abstracting by requiring the same. Well, um, yes, but that's from a usability point of view. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and this is a problem because when you uh, want to say that this operation distributed with that one, you really do need to name them. And, and you can't be polymorphic over that. And I would like to, I don't know how. So, right. Um, and, and LaTeX complains bitterly because the graph keeps going and going and going. Uh, so you, that slide says that does scale. It seems to illustrate something that doesn't scale. Right. Uh, uh, dot doesn't, graph is doesn't, uh, because there's 1,046 yeah. dots in there, and graph is doesn't like that. Well, it's better now. <laughs> yeah, I can't display a graph with, with a thousand dots in it. Uh, and it, it's 2,400 lines of code uh, just because we want to be able to read it. But, you know, the factor of 2.5 is not too bad for, for you know, thousand theories, 2.5 lines per. Uh, but it, what this really denotes. If I was going to write it by hand, it is 13,000 lines. Like if once you expand it out to all the theories that I meant without any of the morphisms, it's this. 
Like right now, if I was to include those thousand theories and add the human being would have written 13,000 lines of code. So that's the true interesting compression. Uh, and, and, you know, we stopped at a thousand theories because we were a little exhausted, uh, but there's a lot more. So speaking of a lot more, uh, I just gave you theories, but for every, every single theory, there's a notion of homomorphism. There's a notion of signature. There's a notion of term algebra. There's a notion of block, block, block. And universal algebra gives us constructions. Each one of these can be mechanized, automatically generated. Um, the ones in red, on the other hand, including partial evaluation, by the way, but that's where we're going to get next. Um, already, if you notice uh, the theory of groups, the writing down what uh, homomorphism is, if you look in, in Agda, um, where the theory of groups was a uh, single sorted equational theory, the Theory of group homomorphism is a parameterized two sorted theory. We've gone right out of the usual scheme. Uh, term algebras are even worse because they involve syntax. And so you're going even further out. Uh, interestingly, Dependent kind of type theory is robust enough that most of these things can actually be internalized. So it's kind of a neat sweet spot where all of a sudden a lot of the things you want to talk about remain uh, things you can still say. Uh, but that's a kind of an interesting part to look at. Um, okay, so, but, but we have to be really careful. We, some people might have seen this, that you can go from magma to group in two different ways by other going through monoid or through loops. Uh, this is true. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the kind of morphisms that I showed you where I add the syntactic concept one at a time, uh, I can do that on both sides and I won't end up at the same place. I will end up with two theories that are equivalent, but they're not, they're not both group as far as what you look at. Uh, and so there's a theory morphism going on. So, so you have to be, what I showed you before was completely syntactic in the sense that this is what you get for free. But this commutes is a theorem, that's not free. So one has to be really careful. I can't like, not everything is free, even at the level of a thousand theories. Right, so uh, I did like theory combinators to algebraic theories, and that's all I've done. Uh, let me now jump down to talk about what I mean uh, from generic algorithms down to efficient programs. Uh, this all. Um, there's different ways of getting generic stuff uh, from dynamic dispatch all the way to metaprogramming. Metaprogramming works better uh, as far as efficiency is concerned. So you kind of want to have very general algorithms and then specialize them and not only specialize them, but partially evaluate them to get rid of all of the extra stuff. Because when you specialize very often, you end up with identity applied to identity applied to identity applied to a plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero. Yes, you might be able to trust your compiler sometimes to get rid of most of them, but not always. So we don't want to trust our compiler. We want to make it by construction. So this is the next kind of bit. And you know, Spiral and FFDW are, are kind of the, the huge champions there that we want to emulate. So, but we want types. Uh, and so we take a huge lesson out of uh, partial evaluation uh, where 
writing a partial evaluator by hand is a lot of work and hard to make work. And the fantastic discovery was that generating extensions with respect to the third Kutumura production um, are actually really easy to write by hand and they work really well. So that's what we're going to do. So program generator generators is, is what we're going to end up targeting. We want to generate program generator generators. Right, three levels. Um, but to get there, uh, we need to look at our algorithms and, and lift them up. Uh, one of the, the key things uh, is, is virtualizing your core language because you want to be able to reinterpret the programs that you do. Uh, so some people could recognize uh, I'm have this or uh, uh, lightweight modular staging at this point. Um, basically, you want to make your whole programming language programmable. Uh, and Scala does that really, really nicely, even though like, I'm not a big fan of it. Their syntax, they, they have that down really well. You instantiate to a uh, partial evaluator, uh, but that joins an interpreter and compiler. And, and then the trick is you need to have the information that you need at the right place, at the right time, to be able to do the simplifications. And that's, that's the hard part. Uh, right. So. Uh, and the trick is I'm going to show you a big application of that, of that kind of thinking. Um, and so we're going to quickly, because I'm kind of running out of time, uh, sort of show the process of how to generalize one of these functions. So this is for panel, we're going to take a, a, the norm of a uh, floating point list as an algorithm. And, and what's the mean? norm of a floating point list well like we're going to consider our floats as some kind of set and and uh and then we're going to have a normed set as, as the one level up from so you're going to try to gener generalize a wave float uh, and and it has then your norm has to be over some commutative set of numbers so commutative monoid is good enough for any norm so uh and S is for norm set. And over the norm set, you have to have a commutative monoid that has to have a zero one of us. So you're reminded of some of the other stuff. And so with the right modules and scope, we've generalized somewhat away from float to a bigger setting. And if you generalize a container to anything that has a map fold on it, then, then now you don't care about lists anymore. Uh, anything can go. But you can keep going. Uh, you can generalize the underlying programming language in which you work. So you stage it. So this, these are the staging combinators. Like we've got now code or later code and uh, then a bunch of meadow camel. And so we can lift the programming language and compiler to couple things together to give us something that, that doesn't actually care when you're going to do this at now or at compile, like at compile time or at runtime. And you do know that your zero is actually known statically. And this is important for simplification. What's the difference between NSC and NS? Um, uh, NS is norm uh, set and NSC is norm set compact. It's the, uh, yeah, I missed that one module. So the NS is uh, at runtime and the NSC is at compact time. And so uh, same thing here uh, for staging, we need a pair of an interpreter and compiler. The compiler just doesn't, doesn't do anything, it just residualizes. So you've also got CM and C. Commuted and monoid, and C is my container. Uh, yes, sorry. My, my it's like this slide would be so busy if I laid out everything. I'm trying to be perhaps being too conceptual, actually made the slide bad. 
Um, key part here is that we do have a monoid, and therefore, when when I have a known a which is zero uh, plus b, then then that's just b. The same from the other side. This is obvious, right? This is just an, the this, the one certification rule we have for monoid. Otherwise, we don't know anything. We just keep going. Um, or plus n and plus l. Uh, there, the now plus and the later plus. In, in all of these, uh, like lift two takes a plus at the interpreter time and a plus at the, for the from the interpreter and one from the compiler. And we, we, we use the one that we can. You can't just call them both plus and have other things work out which one you want. Uh, in some languages, you can do that, and and the compiler times go through the roof uh, because the compiler has to work really, really, really hard. It's possible. I'd much rather that the compiler takes a long time than that I do. Well, uh, it anyway, makes it go faster, even though it's going uh, to plus. I know something he was saying, something Right. So, down, down this route lays uh, like many, many, many papers were generated from COC because it, the, the instance resolution there, even for just univariate, because it's uh, uh, canonical structure, just takes forever. So, yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, so you put it all together. So uh, that that they're all the same. You realize that in fact they have the same signature. So you 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 can lift that up one more time. Um, you can make it a, a generic norm that, that takes as a variability, and now you have uh, an amazingly generic notion of norm that that uh, can work with has virtualized the programming language has has worked over any norm set over any data structure for super channel uh, and then you can go back down uh, when you can instantiate so a whole lot of meadow camel but the, the point is you can either generate code from it uh, and look at it or test it now, and it's, you're instantiating the same thing, so you can test your stuff, not just generate code. Uh, and you can try and take a look at it too. Um, and so if you instantiate with a three tuple of integers, um, you end up with one piece of code. And when, when a different list that has different amounts of static and dynamic information the residualized, fairly different looking uh, piece of code, but they came from the same thing. Uh, and that was the real thing. And uh, we've got now enough genericity that we can start doing stuff with this that we know when we residualize, we're going to get nice code. So we apply that to a geometric kernel, which is the heart of a finite element method for a PDE solver. Um, and the high level picture, you have the things you really want to talk about, which are your geometric objects and n dimensions and affine spaces. And at the heart of it in black, you've got your abstract algebra, your numbers and your code which are all completely virtual that you want to plug and play stuff. And sandwiched in between the two, you've got a layer of linear algebra, which translates between the two worlds. And what the reason is in red is you want to eliminate by construction, all of the linear algebra. You want to do all of it at compile time. And that's where you really, really win. The other thing is you get to say your algorithms 
at the level of n-dimensional linear affine spaces, which is lovely. You say it once and, and it works for lots of stuff. And then you compile it down and you get the code that you would have assigned in your second year class to do for something really, really, really simple on the nose. Uh, because all this, it's the linear algebra that makes everything easier. So expand it out, there's more stuff going on, but it's basically what I've just said. Uh, and in the middle, there's a lot of symbol shuffling that, that happens, but you designed it with, with a very, very careful. And somebody's gonna recognize multiple, I want frets throughout this talk. Uh, so I did the bottom three. Let's jump right to the top. Uh, the scariest part. Uh, we really want to do operations at the level of diagrams because there's even more structure in our theory graphs. So I picked commutative here, but and there's spelling mistakes and it's an image, unfortunately, of commutative. And you think that you know, making your commutative, instead of your commutative over a particular graph of development glue it over semi group, you get this. Fortunately, it doesn't work. Um, you end up uh, having uh, too many things being commutative too early. Um, and, and so you end up actually having to have a little bit of redundancy on the left so that you actually get the things that you were looking for all along uh, correctly on the right. So I won't go into much details on this. But what you much more, uh, if you look in real libraries of lots of code, you'll notice that like they do do this, but things like, oh, let's have an ordered semi-group and an ordered monoid and an order this and an order that. And that is a functorial operation to add an order. And you want it to be, uh, to work with the operations in the right way. So, so doing these operations correctly, at the level of graphs is important. If you want to just go, oh, I had a thousand theories. I want them to be ordered now, please give me 2000. Um, oh, actually, yeah, you, you meant that all the operations were total? No, no, can you, can you give me the version with the operations are partial now? Oh, you silly person, you use propositional equality. I really mean over setoids. Please repeat, you know, copy paste those thousand theories and change the equality. I kind of like to do that as a graph operation once and for all, because I'm lazy. Uh, but, but a purpose. And this one. Uh, so, so graph, theory graph level operations uh, also things you want. And there's even more uh, coming down in the middle. Um, one of the things to be really careful of is intention versus extension. So if we talk about values in our model space, thank you, I'll try to go quickly to it. So, so if you set, set models and three is that ugly thing, uh, the code three is some set of bits that you're representing. And, and when I write down three in my native tongue, I read it in a different way. Uh, and these three threes uh, are all radically different, but related. So, so uh, as I've said on Twitter, uh, any computer scientist who is not a huge fan of Magritte's Cecilia Pazin Pip really doesn't understand the concept of representation and what's going on uh, in, in a lot of interesting CS. So I'm going to note them as three code three and code three uh, to be explicit about syntax. And so one plus two is, is three, but the codes and the syntax aren't the same. Uh, one can be run, you can evaluate the other. Uh, and the point is that code or code type, we want to consider that to be opaque in the sense that we don't want to do introspection on code but we do want to do introspection on syntax. Uh, pattern matching on the one, but not on the other. Uh, this is a design decision. You might want to do it differently, but, but 
it's useful to have all of them. What does it buy you to not be able to do the introspection? Uh, so there's there's some really or? interesting things about well right now well, there's some theorems in Wally Taha's thesis on, on meta ML about doing the wrong kinds of pattern matching on uh, code will give you unsoundness. So yet yet you you need to have better type systems to be like it's it's really dangerous. Uh, you can't do it. It's not that you should. It's that uh, it's unclear if we have good type systems that won't let you do weird stuff. But can you also take advantage of not being able to observe it to use a somehow I don't know more efficient or better representation? Or does that? Uh, well, so not uh, not being able to inspect it uh, as in Meadow Camel. Uh, hasn't proven to be a problem at all. It actually pushes you to make sure that the static information that you have, you keep around and you don't throw it away. And, and you, you, may, you, you get to know which information you use for your simplifications much better because you're not allowed to look at the code you just generated. So, so you, you learn a different discipline. So it's, it's, I haven't encountered any code that I can't generate. But that doesn't mean that it's the right way to do it. Just means that it works. Uh, right. So from syntax, we can go to code. Uh, and we're back to, to uh, automatic generation. Um, so I talked a lot about term languages. And so from the theory of monoids, I can come up with the theory of the syntax of monoid terms. And, and this is derivable. Right? You just take, throw away the type, you throw away the accents, and you take the other two. You can parameterize this by variables as well, if you so wish. The interesting part uh, is that things like length um, is a generic fold of the syntax, and, and, and it's fine. Uh, but simplification, which come from the axioms, you can get one from the left unit and the right unit because they're length reducing, and you don't get one from associativity because it's not. Um, and so it's much harder to do anything with that. But this is all kind of generic. Um, and, and from these simplification rules for free, you can build a mildly optimizing compiler uh, for expressions over. Uh, Algebraic theories. Uh, right. Sorry, you said. So we did some of this. We only took 227 theories. We used uh, universal algebra to generate 10 different derived theories from it. So that gives from 227 theory expressions, we get 5,000 definitions of interesting mathematical theories, uh, which expanded out our 32,000 lines of code. We export to both lean and agda and a type check. So we have not generated to junk because it's kind of hard to get both lean and agda to agree on 32,000 lines of code to say, yes, that was good code. Um, it does take a while, uh, but the information theory point of view is that there's 227 lines of information there, even though Aga wants those 32,000 lines to be happy. That's a big, big ratio. So from 227 theories, you've got 32,000 lines. What's the thing in the middle of the 5,000? Um, so the, um, the number of different names, like, uh, Group, group of homomorphism, group isomorphism, uh, term language of groups, uh, evaluator of groups. Uh, Aren't those all different theories? Yeah. Right, so that's the 227. That's the 5,000. So group counts for one. Yeah. Group homomorphism is two. Oh, I see. So from the, those 227 things, each one blows up because from it you get. Several things. Yes. 
Right. Because that much of it gets it's all 5,092 over 227 different thingies from each state. Right. Okay. Because you turn that crank of universal algebra and you go just construction after construction after construction, whoosh, those things are free. Uh, but, but right now in our systems, they're not. Uh, if you wanted all of these, a human being would have had to type 32,000 last code. This is not necessarily the right way to do it. This is the, wow, we're leaving a lot of information on the table, the way we're currently building our stuff. What does the flattener do? Uh, the flattener basically takes the theory expressions and makes them into theories. Like gives me uh, a commutative magma, a commutative monoid out of the expression that I wrote down. Because oh. Agda doesn't like my combinators. So I have to expand them up. So that's essentially seven to the one family is in one to ten. So that's the bit that takes you from 227 data expressions to 5092 library definitions. No, that's the part that takes me from 5000 library definition to 232,000 lines of code. So uh, in the middle, yes. uh, we take these, these mixed syntax semantic theories and expand them out. And I, I'm going to go through, but basically it's again matching up. Uh, the, 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 the various theories at various stages uh, and, and noticing again, where do the simplifications come from? Uh, and the same thing can be done with concrete theories as abstract theories. Uh, it's relatively easy to pattern match the definition of an int monoid to a code of int monoid. This is also mechanical and also mechanical to how to match it to a staged version, except for that simplifier here, which is not entirely free unless you're a devout of Frex. And I've actually said everything. I'm out of time, and we have also questions. If someone wants to stay in later and over time, then you can stay a bit longer. But if you need to go, then please feel free to. Yes, sure. So. so you sort of outline a way of building these things where you start by working in your own system, which you've not given a name, by the way. So it used to be called, well, it is called masking, and we built multiple prototypes. Uh, and uh, I'm Kind of given up on it as far as uh, trying to keep it alive because there wasn't enough people in it. So I'm now trying to find uh, another team who's receptive to these ideas and I will rebuild it on top of theirs. Whether it be Agda or Idris or whatever. Uh, uh, so, so, anyhow, the, the model you talk about, you start in masking, from it, you would generate. Um, all this stuff and eventually compile into a huge amount of lean or agda say. So that's the current, that's the prototype to show that it works. This is not meant to be, this is how you do it. This is, uh, look at how much free information. This is what you're table. doing it now. And the question that's going to ask is, is that the right way to do it or should we be no, doing something no, that's in no. our life? We, we, we should create a proper DSL that lets you describe what you want and then you you residualize exactly those bits. No, not even. So my current idea is you have a DSL that tell, like, that says, here's the things that I, that I actually want. And then those are, are, get done, but not the rest. I mean, you want Agda to be able to let you talk about signatures and themes and combinations, so you don't have to generate Agda code that does it, right? And you want to be able to yeah. have those abstract combinators, but have the ease of having a flattened record when you define your algebras. Right, and, right. And so, so currently you have none of them. Right, right. right. And, and so, so like record definitions in Agda or Idris are not first class. You can't manipulate them. Right? You can't you can't read what but you can kind of do it with a little bit of reflection, but eventually you run out of steam because there's all these issues of name generation. Right? That that if you 
don't feed it the thing enough names, it's going to. But the, the, the encodings you can use to go. Like, yeah, but, but, so maybe not very nice. no, but right, but you, you immediately lose the usability, right? And, and so the, the reason I'm saying stuck, it's not that I can't do it, it's just that it's so ugly that it's going to be unusable. Right. And you, you kind of want to be programming in your programming language, right? right. And some encoding of your programming language, right? right. You're going to need to write your high names new generated rather than just reflect rates of skin ones and be trying to avoid doing that normally because it's much harder to reason the mouse in that direction. So is the next thing, for instance, to um, put together a proposal for what these features would look like in Agile or Lean or something? But I've, been, I've definitely been talking with uh, the uh, active people, and I will be there at the next Agile implementers meeting to, to see uh, where we can go. Um, in Agda, there's a big problem of the current architecture uh, does scope checking too early and thus makes it really, really hard uh, to implement any of this. Uh, and, and yes, for no's. Uh, but it would mean re-architecting the, the scope checker to, to happen at the same time as type checking instead of... So you're making the talk them. about all that at the A that I can go see? Uh, well, so first I need to sit down with the implementers and really understand what's going on, and then perhaps so. You show and tell at the beginning. So that's, that's happening here. Right. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So I'm planning to be back then to, to, to see what we can actually do. So as we're getting this started, right, rather than having it perfect, like, right? yeah, to extend everything. I, clearly, you know a lot about this. I would love to understand more about what you know, but just to see a sketch of what design in something like Act or Lean might look like, mm -hmm. and then sketching what the barriers to this are, which are things like the scope, that'd be quite valuable, I think. I'd love to see that. Okay. We've got this slight image of a horrible library of existing record systems. I'm trying to talk about what is it? Suspect like what I should yeah, tell you. So I did there's, is just... there's a real issue of, about typing this with respect to record systems where most. Uh, so for Lambda terms, all of this is easy because the Bruin says, who get rid of the names. Yeah, um, nice. but, but once you go to context, name context, now, now you have to deal with your names and and how the records are related to each other's with names. Uh, I've yet I've read a lot of papers on this and I'm unsatisfied with all of them, except there's a couple of things that James McKenna has written that, that I like. So I want to talk to him. <laughs> we probably going to need to talk about the names of this name, so I yeah. can act. Well, except that um, the lucky thing about uh, the theory, the, the category of context is the good maps or the display maps that forget things. And interestingly, forgetting things is actually better behaved than adding things. And that is kind of odd. Because normally just doing off on your category doesn't do anything, but here it does. So so once you build this thing, uh, I guess the actual code you would generate would only be for the theories you're actually using. So, you well, so it depends on whether you want to generate a library or if you want to generate a library, like a, a just-in-time library for the application you're building. Both, both are feasible. Right. Okay. The, the, but the, was the, was that right? The, the thing that was taking a long time was the type checking of absolutely everything. Right. You wouldn't have to do that because you'd type check the generic thing once and for all, and that'd be really quick. Well, if you trust it, so once. if you trust it, like, like if you write it in Agda where Agda knows about reflection so that it type checks it, yeah, maybe. But right now, like the generator is written in Haskell. Right. Because I'm slumming it instead of but like, using a decent language. I was just, well, you still would. <laughs> right. I, I was just wondering if you had the what did you start up with 227 lines and you ended up with 32,000 lines of 
you're, you're just not going to be generating all that code anyway, are you? Unless, or, or are you saying if you were building a library, you would generate all of that code? So um, that code, in 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 some sense, uh, wants to exist, right? If some people are doing quandals, they then care about quandal homomorphisms. And although it's just because you're never going to encounter a quandal in your life, doesn't mean that right. some other person won't. Maybe you might only build it when you want to build a quandal. Perhaps, when perhaps. <laughs> but if you want to be clicking around on the documentation on the web, and oh, if it's not generated, then then you won't find it. So some you send it to that to the docs. Well, you can still have that lazy car right now. Yes. Yeah, so so there is a lot of engineering questions open as to how to do this properly. A different question I have is what's the actual blow up here? Because you start with two two seven, that's tiny, and you end up with thirty categories. We might imagine if if that's not linear, if it's uh, well, so if you expand the definition something. of uh, 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 no, but uh, module over Q is uh, vector space. To extend a vector space alone, uh, the the that's 30, 35, Like it's 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 a few operations, but a whole lot of axioms. It's going to have to fall a lot of that. So, so, like a lot of the stuff that we deal with, or if you write them out in full, are actually quite big. Yeah, I'm just imagining if you if you're doing some little experiments, if you actually scale this up, it might be that you're trying to generate billions of lines. Of yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which is which is not going to be feasible. Right, exactly. Probably ever. Right. Um, so. I don't quite that far. People are willing to do distributed compilation. No, 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 you know the, the libraries of even just uh, category theory library or agda that's a lot of stuff there and and you end up wanting an incredible number of the intermediate points like, so so graded monomial categories do exist uh like symmetric monomial is not the only thing that exists and so you know the, 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 the finer points you find them out there in the literature, and so it's a little hard to. I don't know. This is the not in the selection language for which we would do the same. Yeah, I, I, yeah. 